as John mentioned, I am an associate professor at SUNY Brockport, and today I'll be talking specifically about Lake Ontario coastal wetlands, which of course include those on the St. Lawrence River. And I'll pre be presenting research that has been done in conjunction with a thesis project that has been undergone by my student, Courtney Scholes. Just a bit of a structure of my presentation today. I'm gonna to talk about background topics in terms of climate change and then how wetlands interface with climate change and then go specifically into Lake Ontario wetland dynamics, including the specific sites and methods that we used for the study that I'm going to present. I'm going to present some preliminary results and then talk about some of the takeaways from this research and also some future directions. A little bit about me. Um, as John mentioned in my brief intro, um, I have been around the world to study wetlands. Wetlands are my passion, but I also have very strong connections to the Great Lakes. And that began when I was um, growing up on a small organic apple farm in Michigan. I then went to study on Lake Superior. And after that, I got an opportunity to study wetlands on Lake Ontario in 2003 as a recent graduate of, of Northland College. And at that point, I, I was part of the Lake Ontario St. Lawrence study and had the first opportunity to visit the, the wetlands of the upper St. Lawrence and greatly appreciated that experience. I then have gone on to have faculty appointments in other Great Lakes watersheds. And now I am an associate professor here at some SUNY Brockport. Moving on to climate change, not going to go into great depth here, but I do want to highlight um, specific dynamics related to greenhouse gases. First of all, here we see a diagram of a typical greenhouse effect that enables us to have a climate that is not freezing. We have greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide and methane that trap outgoing heat. With human-based emissions of carbon dioxide, methane, and other greenhouse gases, we have essentially been trapping more heat, uh, which has led to increased temperatures. And I do want to highlight the two gases that I am uh, showing here. Carbon dioxide and methane are considered the number one and number two greenhouse gases that promote the warming of the planet. And these gases are both increasing and have been increasing um, for, for the last um, quite a few decades now. Carbon dioxide has been increasing fairly linearly since the 1960s. And methane, while it did have a brief hiatus there in the early 2000s where the increases leveled off, has now continued to increase over time, again, amplifying the global warming effect. A recent interactive from the New York Times highlighted that in the United States, approximately 80% of the population may be exposed to at least one climate hazard in the future. And I want to look at our particular region. And here we can note um, in the Great Lakes region, particularly, and then along Lake Ontario, the main hazard is flooding. We've already been experiencing climate change in the Great Lakes region. We know from the Great Lakes Integrated Science and Assessments Group, GLISLA, uh, that our average temperature has increased to 2.3 degrees Fahrenheit. We've increased to uh, increased 16 days of the frost-free season. Total precipitation has increased by 14%. And most notably, heavy precipitation events have increased by 35% in the period of 1951 to 2017. This of course is particularly highlighted in our region by a, a, a precipitation anomaly. So this, this uh, deviation from um, percent of normal in April of 2017 
where precipitation was roughly two times as much as in an average month. And this was not just 2017, but rather 2017 to 2019 showed the highest three year totals in 100 years in terms of precipitation in the Great Lakes region. And that this highest three year total is then linked directly to the highest water levels on all of the Great Lakes in recorded history. And we also know that while this is the current climate change, we're also expecting these trends to continue in the future. So what about wetlands? Uh, I wanna talk about how wetlands are both affected by and also influence climate change in this next section. Wetlands are noted as a natural climate solution. This is from a recent paper by Griscom et al. in 2017, where they found that the protection, management, and restoration of natural ecosystems could provide up to a third of the amount of emissions reductions needed by 2030 to meet uh, goals about, uh, about climate change. This is, of course, in addition to all the other tools that we need to put in place in terms of clean energy, et cetera, to reduce the emissions such that we don't have the extreme temperatures that could create uh, severe ecological problems in the future. And so we see here in, in this diagram about these natural climate solutions that two aspects related to, to wetlands are key to um, this, this particular solution to climate change. And we see that protection of wetlands and restoration of wetlands plays a key role here. We know that wetlands buffer climate change. And I use buffer because this actually covers two big topics associated with wetlands and climate change. First of all, wetlands help with the effects of climate change. So for example, drought periods, uh, can be alleviated through wetlands replenishing uh, waterways under low flow periods. We know that um, during flood events, during these stream precipitation events, wetlands store floodwaters. An acre of wetland can store one, uh, one to 1 1.5 million gallons of flood water. And also along the coasts that are exposed to extreme weather events and, and winds, et cetera, there's coastal protection provided uh, in, these, in these buffer areas. We also know that wetlands can reduce emissions and that's through the process called carbon sequestration. We often talk about this in terms of peatlands, um, those areas also that collect sediment. And I'm gonna be talking about this particular aspect of wetlands um, in terms of how they affect climate change in, in our region. And I need to talk about this in more specific because while carbon sequestration talks about the uptake of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, wetlands naturally release another potent greenhouse gas, methane. So oftentimes we're talking about this give and take of the two greenhouse gases. Additionally, these critical services can both be enhanced or degraded based on human actions. And so understanding more about these dynamics can help us guide managers in terms of making decisions about how some of these natural systems can play a role in climate change solutions. But first, a little graphic here, um, carbon cycling in wetlands. So here we have our plants and it's a flooded area. And we know, of course, that plants are taking up carbon dioxide through photosynthesis. There's also sediment deposition. Sediment slows when it comes to a wetland area. And when it slows in the water, it drops out. Some of that sediment will have carbon associated with it. Some of the carbon dioxide that's been taken up is also respired by plants. It's under a natural process. What is not respired is then sequestered as both living biomass, here shown in green, as well as sequestered carbon, uh, which is sequestered in the soil um, and also the, the dead litter that accumulates. We know that 
carbon is sequestered in these systems because flooded conditions slow decomposition rates by bacteria. We also know that under these same conditions, these flooded conditions, bacteria that thrive under anaerobic or low oxygen conditions, flooded conditions, produce methane. And that methane is then released to the atmosphere. Methane is known to be approximately 28 to 36 times more potent than carbon dioxide. And it exists in the atmosphere for approximately 12 years. This is a relatively short time period compared to carbon dioxide, for example. It needs to be considered when we're, especially when we're talking about wetlands. Oops. So getting back to this idea of wetland carbon balance and how we assess carbon sequestration. First of all, in terms of carbon uptake, wetlands store approximately 35% of global terrestrial carbon. This is the equivalent of all global forest biomass. We also know that wetlands are the largest natural source of, of methane to the atmosphere, and it represents approximately 32% of emissions. And this is, of course, what wetlands do naturally. But what happens when they become degraded? Well, we know that when wetlands are drained, they become a source of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere because essentially under unflooded conditions, bacteria are able to decompose the, the stored carbon in the wetlands and just release it, respire it into the atmosphere. We also know that different changes to wetlands, including impoundment, a warmer, wetter climate, and also invasive species such as cattail can increase methane emissions to the atmosphere. And in fact, a study in Great Lakes wetlands found that areas invaded by cattail had over three times the amount of methane release than native plant communities. So what about restoration? We know that those wetlands that have been drained and then re-wetted, restored in terms of their hydrology, then turn around and increase their carbon storage again. But less is known about the methane response to restoration, and it really has depended on the technique use in terms of restoration, as well as the wetland type. Lastly, we know that uh, restoration of low methane emitting wetlands could result in a net cooling effect over a hundred year time frame. So this is, this is an exciting piece associated with how we understand wetlands and their restoration playing a role in climate mitigation. Okay, here I am, Lake Ontario wetlands. Uh, this is a photo of Flynn Bay in the St. Lawrence River. This is a photo by Doug Wilcox from the Lake Ontario study. Great Lakes coastal wetlands are all those wetlands that interface between the aquatic and the terrestrial where uh, vegetation is affected by Great Lakes water levels. And, uh, as, as Lawrence mentioned in the previous talk, first of all, wetlands being the norm, I love that. Uh, thank you very much, Lawrence, for that sentiment. Uh, we also know that there's been a history of loss in terms of Great Lakes coastal wetlands. In er certain areas, there's been a great amount of loss, up to 95% of Great Lakes coastal wetlands have been lost in certain areas. Across the entire basin, the estimate varies from 50 to 66% uh, loss of, of Great Lakes coastal wetlands across the basin. You can see here that um, on the St. Lawrence River, there is a nice um, sweep. There's, there's a, a um, nice representation of Great Lakes coastal wetlands in this region here, of course. We also know that wetland extent and diversity of these Great Lakes coastal wetlands is driven by water levels and their fluctuations. I'm going to talk about that in more detail here. This is a diagram on the left-hand side of uh, from Maynard and Wilcox in 1997, illustrating how the vegetation diversity and structure changes given the water level fluctuations of the Great Lakes. I've also included a, a diagram here that shows the, um, the fluctuations of Great Lakes 
Michigan, Erie, and Lake Ontario on the right hand side. So on the on the left hand side here, we see high water levels, which is of course where we're at right now. We would expect the dieback of woody plants, the dieback of rooted dominant emergence, such as cattail if they're if they're rooted, and also an expansion of aquatic and and, and floating mat communities. Following those high water levels, so on any of these periods of time where Great Lake has increased, it's also come back down. We see that when those water levels come back down, we see a regrowth of diverse wet meadow and emergent marsh communities from the seed bank. And we also see a receding of the aquatic communities. Under low water levels, we see an expansion of the wet meadow community and the emergent marsh and a further recession of the aquatic communities. And so this band of vegetation that we, that we find for Great Lakes coastal wetlands is dependent on both the, the rise and the fall, these water level fluctuations of the Great Lakes. What we've noticed since the 1960s on Lake Ontario, uh, more, more specifically, is uh, what I call the catalyzation of Lake Ontario marshes. Now, I did not coin the term catalyzation that was coined in 1988 by William E. Odom, but it is, a, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting characteristic of North American marshes, not only on Lake Ontario, but that this was seen across the continent. And while cattail was of, of some kind or another was, was in this area, you know, previously to European settling and whatnot, we saw a great expansion of cattail in Lake Ontario following the installation of the Moses Saunders Dam. So here, what I'm showing you up at the top is aerial photo uh, designation of meadow marsh species. So those are things like blue joint grass and sedges here in black. And then here in gray is the cattail areas prior to the, the dam being installed here in 1959. We then notice following the 1960s that there were, was not a return of any low water conditions. And remember the low water conditions in my previous slide was associated with that expansion of the meadow marsh community. And following the missing low water conditions, uh, we see this great expansion of cattail into the previous meadow marsh zones. This is South Cowell Pond on the eastern shore of Lake Ontario. So here's a, a graphic or a picture rather of, of how, this, how this happens. Here we see the sedge meadow here so in this narrow band, the cattail has moved into this area and has pinned this, this sedge meadow in between the shrub zone and the emergent marsh zone, creating this, this squeeze and um, displacing the sedge meadow community. And this was not only seen, uh, this was seen in a variety of studies, including those done by Doug Wilcox and uh, Dr. John Farrell up at SUNY ESF, looking at upper St. Lawrence wetlands as well. And what was found was that cattail increased with higher water levels. And so we see this displacement of the sedge meadow and, and the diversity of these zones. Just a brief technical aside, sometimes I just need to clarify uh, what I mean by invasive cattail, particularly for this study. And invasive need not be only applied to non-native species, but rather we can ask a functional question. Does the species increase in response to environmental change and dominate wetlands by displacing other species? In that case, we have indeed seen that both narrowleaf cattail, Typhangustifolia, and the hybrid with the native Typha latifolia, Typha X glauca, in North America has been shown to increase due to nutrient enrichment as well as stabilized hydrology. 
Thus, I'm using invasive in this context. That invasive can be applied to cattail depending on the context. And certainly that's what we see in Lake Ontario marshes. So here's another look at the Great Lakes coastal wetlands. And if we zoom in on Lake Ontario, we see that a lot of pink. And the pink here is designating cattail dominated wetlands. Again, reflecting the, the change in water level regulation, for example, but also other stressors that have led to cattail domination. And the study that I'm going to talk about today is in Braddock Bay Wildlife Management Area on the southern side of Lake Ontario, just, just west of Rochester, New York. Here in Braddock Bay, there's been a great effort to restore wetland and habitat diversity. And this is uh, part of the Rochester Bay area of concern that's been designated by the EPA. And there's been a great amount of investment here. This is a restoration project that has a price tag of approximately $9 million to really focus on increasing this wetland and habitat diversity. And so there were a variety of different techniques used for this study, including opening up areas in the cattail mat. So this is floating cattail mat. And here we see open water areas that were excavated. The light blue are channels, particularly for the migration, the, the movement of northern pike. And then here in the bright pink is what I'm going to be focusing on today. These are cattail treatment areas with native uh, species planting. And I just want to note that these pink areas, they're, they're particularly important for um, northern pike spawning, for example, that's where the channels are leading them to, but also that um, these are areas that without the lower water levels were remaining to be cattail. And so there needed to be some type of treatment conducted to make those into a meadow marsh as opposed to cattail uh, by active, active treatment. And again, because these aren't, these particular areas aren't on a floating map. So these are the areas most influenced by water level fluctuations and would particularly respond to the return of low water periods. So of course, this was, this was a focus on, on uh, wetland and habitat diversity restoration, particularly for fish and bird species. And we have seen that response. There's been, uh, increase in young of your pike that have been found in Braddock Bay, as well as an increase in bird diversity. But we asked a secondary question. If invasive cattail increases methane emissions in other Great Lakes wetlands, what effect does its removal have and its restoration to native plant communities on wetland climate mitigation, including carbon sequestration and methane emission? So that was, that was our question. How does restoration play a role in uh, these wetlands, carbon balance and climate mitigation potential? So here we are again in, in Braddock Bay and I worked with my student to select three different wetland areas to study the cattail removal and replanting versus cattail monoculture we also included a native meadow marsh to also get that perspective that had never been invaded by cattail. Sampling methods included gas sampling during summer months, biomass and soil sampling at the end of the summer, below ground monitoring of soil oxygen and moisture throughout the growing season, which we're still processing the data on. You'll notice um, up in the upper left hand side, um, that's my student Courtney Scholes and my other student um, Kevin Killigrew. And that is what we do in order to do the gas sampling. We have a portable greenhouse gas analyzer and it's hooked up to a clear chamber to look at the flux over time. And we're able to use our cell phones in real time and see the increases and the decreases in the greenhouse gases when they're, when they're under the, the chamber over time. So without further ado, some preliminary results. First of all, I wanna express that the restoration was 
considered a success. The cattail treatment zones in both Buck Pond and Braddock Bay, they had their cattail cut two times and the litter removed during midsummer and any cattail re-sprouts were herbicided in early fall for two years. Okay, so this is considered one of the best techniques for areas that you can't flood to get rid of cattail. And indeed, there was a decrease in cattail cover from approximately 50% prior to treatment to about 5% cover after treatment. There was also an increase in native species richness. However, the actual species there depended on the water level of Lake Ontario, which varied greatly over the course of this study. In 2018, when I first saw this site, there, there was no water in this area. It was dominated by uh, annuals, oops, such as uh, beggar's tick here. And then in 2019, we had a meter of water in this area and it was dominated by submerged and aquatic vegetation. Just to highlight what we're dealing with in terms of the sampling, uh, in 2019, we sampled under the highest, highest water ever recorded on Lake Ontario for July and um, also continued high water in August. And then uh, record levels were also high in 2020. However, you can see that they were, they were much lower than 2019. The cattail influenced areas, so the treatment zones and the cattail zones hadn't been dewatered since early, uh, so January of 2019. So they were flooded for essentially uh, over an entire year before we sampled them the second time. Also, our uninvaded meadow was at a different elevation. This is important for uh, methane dynamics because it's reliant on how long they're flooded for essentially. So I did want to point that out that the uninvaded meadow uh, was not even flooded during the 2020 sampling, which affects the results. So here's some preliminary results, have the press in terms of methane flux. So the amount of, of methane emitted to the atmosphere we didn't find any differences amongst the sites or the treatments in 2019 under extraordinarily high water levels. But in 2020, we saw uh, that cattail plot methane was higher than in the treatment areas and in the uninvaded plots. So under that, after you know, a long period of flooding, we did start to see the cattail plots produce more methane than the treatment and certainly the uninvaded, which you can see is virtually at zero. For above ground biomass, the cattail plots had a lot of above ground productivity. As you well know, this is a plant that grows over 10 feet tall. So this is not a surprising uh, result. However, what was interesting is in 2020, it did have a higher amount of biomass, perhaps, you know, again, due to the, the relatively lower water levels than in 2019. We also saw that the percent carbon in the soil was higher in those areas that had either been cattail and then treated or were currently cattail than the uninvaded um, meadow. And this could also uh, translate into there being more methane being released because there was more percent soil in the carbon in, in the sorry, more percent C in the car in the in the soil. Moving on to discussion and for future directions. First of all, Lake Ontario wetland restoration targets fish and wildlife habitat by restoring native plants and structure. We particularly looked at an additional uh, uh, service that the wetland restoration could provide. The way of restoring plants and their structure was particularly effective using this two-time cattail uh, cutting and, and herbicide technique. And we did start to see an indication that this extra benefit of restoring the native plant community could be that it's lowering greenhouse gas emissions of methane from Lake Ontario wetlands under high water conditions or extended flooded conditions. 
there leaves a lot of questions as well, including what will the return of low water conditions mean for both the reestablishment of the meadow marsh as well as any of these effects on carbon sequestration or the emission of methane. So to follow up on some of these um, particular questions, uh, first of all, my student is working on an experiment to separate the effects of plant species and also the removal of cattail um, soil, basically the, the organic layer that the cattail builds up in order to see if what, what effects those particular uh, aspects have on methane emission. So she's currently working on that. And there's also potential for a broader study across Lake Ontario wetlands to observe trends over time. And um, this, you know, of course, we're just dealing with, you know, three wetlands in the Braddock Bay wet wildlife management area. It'd be interesting to see how that, how that translates into a larger scale study. We know that future climate change is predicted to be warmer and wetter with more extreme weather events here in the Great Lakes region. We know wetlands can help buffer coastlines while providing flood storage and mitigation, which restoration appears may enhance, especially under extended flooded conditions. And lastly, wetland conservation and restoration can be key natural solutions to increasing resilience in the face of climate change for Lake Ontario and the St. Lawrence region. And studies like the one that I just presented to you can help guide management of wetlands for particular project goals if they include climate mitigation, for example. I'd like to acknowledge my funding, um, both from SUNY Brockport as well as the Great Lakes Research Consortium and also the, the individuals that helped us on this particular project, my Welland Lab, my colleagues, um, and many of those who helped during these extraordinary times. And with that, I thank you for your attention. And um, if there's time for questions, I am open to them. Thanks, Dr. Schultz. Um, I just want to say if there are any audience members at the bottom of your screen, you'll find a Q&A panel um, and you can submit questions through that and then I will read them. Um, so the first question that we've got is how large of an area of wetland would make an impact? Um, like, do you have to have it be Braddock Bay size or can it be smaller than that? Well, so you're talking about an impact on, you know, on something that's a global scale issue. So I do agree that, you know, we'd have to be talking about, you know, the big, the big picture, like Gray Lakes coastal uh, wetland restoration uh, in terms of the cattail converting into the native, the native plants. But yes, you're right, on a very small scale, these tend to be, the main responses there tend to be for, you know, specific animal species, for example. We'd have to take it in a bigger hole to really think about changes to, or the ability to mitigate climate change effects at a large scale. Thank you. Um, the second question, I am not a biologist, so I'm going to probably garble these names, but um, can Typha latfoila become invasive as has been documented for August Foila and Glauca? Right, so Typha uh, latifolia is also known as the broadleaf cattail. And indeed, in response to changes in nutrient dynamics, so the pulse of you know, increased nutrients into a system, they have been shown to increase and become dominant in an area, which would, which would be in line with the definition that I gave um, earlier. So we have seen this uh, when they've pumped, for example, uh, you know, sewage into peatland areas and those become dominated by, by broadleaf cattail, we, we would consider that to be, to be an invasive characteristic. But in terms of Great Lakes coastal wetlands, we very rarely see that activity from Typha latifolia. It's really been mostly the hybrid cattail, Typha exglauca, 
that has been increasing its abundance throughout the Great Lakes coastal wetlands. Uh, there's somebody who has just submitted one that wants you to know that that was a wonderful presentation, which I completely agree with. Um, they also want to know, are you seeing cattail dominated sphagnum mats in Great Lakes coastal wetlands? Oh, well, this, this is something very close to my heart. Um, so I, this is, this is one project that I, that I work on, um, again, with my student Courtney schools. Um, however, I also am working with a student, Sarah Kirkpatrick, on a neighboring wetland, which has a, what we call a coastal fen, a coastal peatland. It's called Cranberry Pond, and approximately 50 acres of this, this wetland was sphagnum dominated. So the sphagnum moss, this acidic moss that we find in particular peatlands, and these rare sedges are in this fairly degraded area. As I've just mentioned, we're surrounded by cattail. And it's been recently, the hybrid cattail has been recently entering into this coastal peatland at Cranberry Pond. And right now, Sarah, my student Sarah is studying uh, particularly the dynamics associated with what's, what's associated with this invasion and also the best strategies to um, eradicate cattail and knock it back from this very special ecosystem um, in this Great Lakes coastal wetland. So yes, we have, <laughs> we have seen it, we're working on it right now. Uh, those are all the questions that are in right now.